So a reminder if you need one, that there is a quiz next class, right? 10.30 to 11. Um, and if you got the links, you know there's a review session you can watch and all quizzes you can work through. And keep perspective, right? It's a 10% quiz and you get a freebie. You don't want to use up the freebie too quickly, but let that be a stress reliever if nothing else, saying, look, if I screw up on the quiz, it's going to go away. Yeah. So uh, it's, uh, I, you know, I'll be around tomorrow. I was thinking, I'd know, I don't think it's worth for me to do a review session per se, because finding an hour is actually you know, where everybody's going to be around, so maybe a subset can be around. So what I'm going to try to do is I will, during that hour, hang out somewhere where people don't feel intimidated about coming in. I mean, obviously, you think my office is either contaminated with the coronavirus or something, you know. So I will find a classroom so you're distant away from me and you're, so it's, a, it's a, you know, you can, you can come in and ask questions. But it'll be probably in the afternoon because of a couple of Zoom sessions I have to do during the day for my online certificate classes. So, um, um, but somewhere around two to three or so, or I'll, I'll try to, I mean, I'll try to find something where people can come in and ask questions. So, but again, not the, it's, it, no, don't let this be the, the weight that hangs over you too much over the weekend. Okay, so um, uh, the, the other thing is there is a case that's, that some of you have looked at the calendar and noticed as a case due April 1st in, cla in class. You have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Which is good because right now you shouldn't be thinking about the case. I have the case ready, but I won't send it to you till after the quiz because what's the point? Right? It's not like you're going to start working on the case right away. It's a case, I mean, it's a case that I concoct. It's, uh, I've never used a Harvard Business School case as you, uh, you know, in, in my classes, but I concoct a case. So the, I've concocted a case where Netflix is going to essentially create a fitness app with fitness equipment. You see who I'm going after, right? That Peloton business model is just so ripe to be taken down. Because how does it work? You buy a treadmill for $2,500 or $4,000. A treadmill, I think, is $4,000. The bike is cheap. It's $2,500. But that's not the end of the game. They charge you $40 a month, essentially, to watch. They proudly claim they have 1,000 videos. You know how many videos Netflix makes per day? Probably 1,000. So it's a Netflix fitness app. I, so I'll give you the facts of the case. I've kind of concocted the facts loosely based on reality. And you have to tell me whether this is a good opportunity for Netflix, is to go into this business. So that's your assignment. I'll talk more about it after you get the case, but I'll, I, so you'll have access to it pretty soon. So wait till after the quiz. You can read it. It's a group case that you work on as a group. Uh, but much of the work you can do on your own. During the break, I'm sure you have nothing planned. This could be a good thing to keep you occup occupied while you're on the beach in the Caribbean or wherever, you know, where, you know, wherever you've decided to go. So that's going to come to you on Monday. Are there any questions before we start, though, on, on the quiz? And the, so everybody's clear on the mechanics of the quiz. If, you miss, if you're going to miss the quiz, you've got to let me know by 10.29 a.m. on Monday. It's got to be before the quiz because it's after that, then I have no idea whether this is an option you're exercising or you tried the quiz and it was too difficult and you've said, I wasn't there because I have no way of knowing. Or it's something that's, a, and I don't need doctor's notes. And so if you're sick, just say you're sick. Just make up a good excuse for God's sake, you know. Just don't say I'm not ready because I'm not going to say maybe you'll never be ready, so it's not that. So make up a good excuse between you and I, that'll be enough for me. And you know, I just gave my undergraduate quiz, and people are saying, I have a, my throat is hurting, my chest is hurting, should I come in and take the quiz? And I said, have you been watching the news? You know, what's wrong with you? No? So hopefully none of you will email me on, on Monday morning saying, I'm feeling deathly ill, and I feel like I'm, you know, but should I come in anyway? No, don't come in, right? I'd rather you not come in and affect the rest of the class. So if you're sick, just stay home. It's not the end of the world. No. So let's get started because I want to finish up this notion of bottom-up betas. Remember how this got started, right? We started with the conventional way of estimating betas, which is to look at a regression, take the slope of the line, 
and say, that's my beta. Somebody help me out there. What's wrong with regression betas? This will give you the ambient, because most people out there use regression betas, Bloomberg betas, adjusted betas. Tell me what the case is against using one regression beta. Why? What's the problem with using a regression beta? There are actually multiple problems. Let's see if we can list them all out. What's the first problem? You can't think of a problem? What, what is it? It is backward looking. So that's the first thing. You're saying, so what? Companies change over time. You have a backward looking number when you want a forward looking number. That's the first problem. Okay? What else? Yes? It has. So if your leverage has changed, another backward looking aspect. If your leverage has changed, the regression beta, even if it's right, reflects the debt ratio you had in the last two years, the last five years. Let's keep going. So it's backward looking, it reflects your business mix and leverage from the past. What's a statistical case against regression betas? It's a large standard, it's one slice of history. Remember that valiant, though. So if you take a company that's in the news for good reasons or bad reasons, its beta is going to get thrown off because you're taking one slice of history and you're getting a noisy estimate. I think the case is overwhelming against a single regression beta. And the statistical case is actually much stronger than the, than the economic case. Statistically, it's crazy to take one path and say, that is my estimate of risk. So now I know this is not fair because you didn't make the case for it. But if you had to make the case for bottom-up betas, and the example that we gave, what's the, what's the advantage of using bottom-up betas? Let's take each problem. first. The betas that I got for each of the businesses was backward looking, right? Because I got the casino betas and I got the vaping betas, but I look backwards. But I used the business mix that you have now or could have in the future. So I've used backward looking data because you really have no choice to get the betas for the businesses. But I can then make the business mix choices based on where you are today. So I've taken backward looking data and made it at least a little more proactive or forward looking. What's the standard error argument for using a bottom-up beta? Much lower standard error. Why? This is the easy one. Law of large numbers, right? The average of 100 screwed up betas is going to be more precise than any one screwed up beta. So you could have a bunch of bad betas, but the average is more precise. And third, you now have the capacity to estimate the beta for a private business, the division of a business, because you now don't need to run a regression. Imagine being in Casper right at the time that they're going public and you have to value Casper. You need a beta for Casper. You're not going to find it on Bloomberg because it's not publicly traded. But if you can do a bottom-up beta, you can estimate the beta for Casper. So today, I'm going to get into the nitty-gritty of estimating bottom-up betas. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you see me struggle because if I just showed you business betas, you say, that's easy. And then you're going to start on your company. You're going to run into brick walls. So I'm going to show you the brick walls I'd run into and how I try to climb over them sometimes, run around them sometimes. But eventually, my end game is I need a bottom-up beta. And I'm going to get there through hell or high water or whatever the right expression is. So let me go back and look at Disney. Remember I, they broke themselves down into five businesses? I'm going to now try to estimate the beta of each of these businesses. Let's start with the first one, the broadcasting business. It's a US broadcasting company. And if you think about big broadcasting companies in the US, you've got CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox. Right? All the others are smaller. And already you can see my problem in finding a bottom up beta, right? 2013, CBS was part of Westinghouse, it was just being spun off. NBC was, had been sold off by G. God only knows where it went into some other big part of a company. ABC was part of Disney. And Fox is part of News Corp. And nobody can find anything in that company. It's kind of a complete complex mess. There were no standalone publicly traded broadcasting companies. That are good. So law of large numbers requires large numbers. And I'm in serious trouble already. So here's the first ploy that I try when I run into trouble finding companies like mine. I look for companies up and down the food chain. What's a food chain here? It's a broadcasting business. I look for companies 
that essentially you know, either feed into the business or feed out of the business because what I'm looking for are companies that do well when I do well and do badly when I do badly. So I'll give you two examples of companies that I ended up using as broadcasting companies. One is a company called King World. It's actually a company that syndicates TV shows. They used to syndicate Jeopardy and the Oprah show. So they syndicate shows and they sell them to the broadcasting companies. They do well when the broadcasting companies are doing well. They do badly. When, so I use it. I use Nielsen. What does Nielsen do? It, it computes ratings on shows. And when broadcasting companies are doing well again, Nielsen tends to do well. And when they do badly, they do badly. So I'm essentially picking companies in the broadcasting business, defining the business more broadly. And when I did that, I ended up with 26 broadcasting companies. Some were small, some were large. I didn't control for size because, in a sense, I don't see why betas and the size of the company should be related. The first reaction is smaller companies are riskier. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. It depends on the business. So if I start to add criteria, every criteria I add will make my sample size smaller. So here, the only way I can get a large enough sample is by bringing in smaller broadcasting businesses into the mix. For theme parks, again, I started with the conventional. Let's go look for theme parks. I looked on Bloomberg for theme park companies. I ended up with two. One was Six Flags, which is a disaster waiting to happen. It has this huge amount of debt constantly on the edge of going under. And the other is the Cedar something from the Midwest, you know, what, what's, Cedar Point, which is a Midwestern theme park company. Law of large numbers doesn't accept two. Two, even if, the, if you just took the two, two is not much better than one. So here again, I had to broaden my sample. And here I went global, not postal, but global. What does that mean? I brought in theme park companies from Europe. And you're saying you can't do that. Says who? I might not. Some numbers I can't compare across the globe. But a, what's the average beta across all US companies? It's an easy one. It's one. The average beta across all European companies is one. Asian. You see, beta is a scale around one, no matter where in the world you're in. So if I tell you my beta is 1.2 in Brazil and a beta 1.2 in the US, they're comparable. You're saying, but a Brazilian company is risky. You're right. The way I show that is with my equity risk premium. Betas were never meant to carry country risk and all the rest of the stuff we worry about. So I went global, and that allowed me to come up with 20 companies. You're saying, how big a sample do I need? I'll give you a very simple rule. Remember when I had 100 companies in my sample? How much more precise was my beta estimate with 100 companies and with the single regression beta? I said it was 10 times more precise. How did I come up with a 10? What's the rule in statistics for deciding how much lower your standard error is going to be as your sample size grows? I think I have to talk to your statistics professors. <laughs> Maybe you need to repeat the statistics class. It's actually a very simple rule. You take the square root of your sample size. So if you have 100 firms, square root of 100 is 10. So with a sample of 100, my estimate is going to be, there are all these other rules. They have to be independent. But if you follow those rules, it's going to be 10 times more precise. So 100 is nice because it's 10 times more precise. But what if I don't leave 49? I'm going to pick numbers where the square root is going to be easy to find. It's going to be 7 times more precise. Not as good as 10, but 7 times isn't bad. What if you have only 25? It's still 5 times more precise. What if you have only 9? Anything beats one, right? Even if you have nine firms, your beta estimate is three times more precise. Would I rather have 100 over nine? Absolutely. But if I can get to 15, 20, 25, I'm already looking at a beta estimate that's much more precise. So 20 I can live with. And then I looked at the movie business. And here I stayed primarily with US movie companies for a simple reason. Outside the US, there are very few movie companies that are publicly traded. And I used a sample size of 10 because I want to use the movie business to kind of get you even further into the nitty gritty to talk about what exactly I did with these 10 companies, because I gave you that hypothetical example. But let's look at what the movie business looks like. So this was my movie business sample. So those are my 10 companies. They're all publicly traded. The regression beta is the levered beta. So I just labeled it to make sure I reminded myself that's a regression beta, it's a levered beta. 
Their market capitalization reflects the market value of their equity. Their total debt, and I include leases as debt, and we'll talk about this later on today, maybe in the next session, is right there. And you can see that the debt for some of these companies is large, some it's small. If you add up the market cap plus total debt, you get what's called the firm value, the value of the entire business. But the value of the business includes some cash. So if I subtract out the cash, you have what's called enterprise value. So basically, I start with market cap. I've got debt. Add the two up. You get the firm value. You net out the cash. You get enterprise value. This is going somewhere, trust me. Okay. I compute some ratios. I compute how much cash this company has as a percentage of firm value. Why? Because remember, cash has a beta of zero. So when I compute an unlevered beta for a company, I'm actually getting a weighted average of how much money it's holding in cash and how much it has in operating assets. I have pre-tax cost of debt that I compute for each company. Some had ratings, I did that. So basically, we'll come back and talk about how to get that pre The marginal tax rate when I did this in 2013 was 40%. Why is it 40%? Because in the US in 2013, the federal corporate tax rate was 35%. You had state and local tax so on top of it. You ended up with 40%. Today, if I did this for a US sector, that marginal tax rate would be 25% because the federal corporate tax rate has gone from 35 down to 21. It's brought the marginal tax rate down. Then I computed what's called a gross debt to equity. This is not a sign of disgust about the debt to equity. I'm taking total debt and dividing by market cap. As opposed to what? As opposed to a practice in Europe and much of the rest of the world where people use what's called net debt to equity ratios. You know what a net debt to equity ratio is? You just net the cash out from the total debt. We'll talk about whether one, I, I'm going to argue that either will work as long as you stay consistent. So I'm going to show you the calculations with both, but this is the total debt to equity ratio. I'm also going to add two more columns, and in a minute you're going to see why these columns are going to come into use. I got the revenues for each company, and what I divided the enterprise value, which is the market value of each firm, by the revenue. So the way to read this, is SFX Entertainment trades at 11.2 times revenues. That's the total value of the company as a multiple of revenues. I did this for each of the 10 companies. None of the numbers there is private information. These are all public information you should be able to get for pretty much any company anywhere in the world. So I have 10 companies. I have the numbers for each of the 10 companies. I want to use this in my assessment of Disney's beta. So here's what I did. I computed the average across the 10 companies, which is typically what you do when you have 10 companies. And I noticed something bothersome. The debt to equity ratio that I was getting was 129.33% for the sector, which sounded high for a movie business. So I took a look at my 10 companies. Do you see why my average is so high? Because I've got this, there are a couple of crazies here. Mass hysteria, which is named appropriately 478% debt to equity. And Odyssey Pictures, 551%. My average is getting pulled up because I have two outliers. Remember st in, in statistics, if you have a data set where you have outliers affecting your average, there's a simple way to get around that, right? Compute the median. So I computed the median values of each. I also added up all the numbers, the debt and the equity, to come up with an aggregate value. Think of that as a weighted average, if you want to, with the larger companies being weighted more than the smaller companies. So I have the average, I have the aggregate, I have the median. I don't trust the average. The outliers are just too crazy. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take what I've computed for this sector and compute an unlevered beta for being in the movie business. So help me out here. When I did this for just one company, I took the levered beta and I unlevered it, right, to come up with the debt to equity. I'm going to do that for the entire sector. And then I'm going to take one extra step saying, I'm getting an unlevered beta for movie companies, but to the extent that they hold cash, I want to take out the cash to see what the unlevered beta of being just in movies is. It's called a pure play beta. I'll give you a very simple intuitive way to think about this. If I gave you an unlevered beta for Apple as a company, about 75% of Apple's value comes from being in the smartphone business, the computer business, the software business, the services business. You know where the other 25% of Apple's value comes from? Cash, which has a beta of zero. So when I give you an unlevered beta for Apple as a company, that's not the beta of the businesses they're in. It's a weighted average of the beta of the businesses they're in and the beta of cash. 
And if I want to get to the bait of the business, I've got to clean up for the cash. So here's what I'm going to do to clean up for the cash. I'm, still, I'm going to start the median. As I said, I'm going to work with medians all the way through because I trust them more. The median regression beta for the movie business is 1.24. You can see that there. One point, where is it? Median, 1.24. So I've got my median beta. The median gross debt to equity ratio was 27.06%. So I'm replacing the average, which is like 120% plus, with the 27. I unlevered my regression beta. So I'm doing exactly what I did for Disney, but at the sector-wide level. I come up with an unlevered beta, 1.07. Four decimals is just overkill. You, know, you really don't need it, so stick with two decimals, 1.07. I'm almost done, right? I have an unlevered beta for a movie company. But I've got one more mopping up thing to do. And what I do to mop up is I reflect the fact that the typical movie company has about 3% cash. So if I think of this as a weighted average, that 3% is a beta of zero, the remaining 97% is the beta of just the movie business, and the weighted average is 1.07. I can back out the beta of just being in the movie business. So I start with the regression beta, unlevered using the gross debt to equity ratio, and I clean up for cash. I take out the effect of cash. I've ended up with the beta of being in the movie business. Now the alternative, is instead of doing this in two steps, is you net the cash out against the total debt. That's a net debt to equity, which will give you a lower debt to equity ratio than you got with them. You'd come up with a non-levered beta that's actually very close to mine. And if you want to go the net debt to equity ratio route, just make that choice up front and go all the way through. It's not, one is not technically right and the other is wrong. They're just different ways of thinking about it. I prefer gross debt and cash for a simple reason. If cash can be here today, gone tomorrow. What if you do a buyback? This way, I have the levers under my control. So the unlevered beta reflects the beta of being in the movie business. So think about the mechanics. If, you're in a comp if you want to get a beta for a business, start by finding publicly traded companies in that business. If you can't find enough, widen your definition of comparable till you get enough. Look up their regression betas. The average of the regression betas and the median, no, probably median is safer, will give you a sense of what the typical levered beta is for companies in the business. Then look up the market cap, so it's got to be market value by equity, and the total debt for each company. Starting in 2019, you don't even have to capitalize leases yourself. Accountants are doing it for you. Take the total debt. Come up with a gross debt to equity ratio. Unlever your beta. You've got an unlevered beta for companies in that business. Last step, clean up for cash. If you're in a business where companies hold a lot of cash, since the beta of cash is zero, it's weighing your unlevered beta down. Take that out, and what you will get is an unlevered beta for the business you're looking for. So that's basically how I got the unlevered beta, 1.0993 that you see. So if you're questioning where did the number come from, just look at the next two pages, and you'll see me backing into that number. So I did the same thing for my broadcasting business and the theme park business. So the last column, I'm getting a pure beta for that business. But along the way, you can see that you have to make some choices. You have to exercise some discretion. But I end up with an unlevered beta for all five businesses. So in that hypothetical example where you're in casinos and vaping, I said I can go look up the unlevered beta. I've now done that for Disney. Do you remember what, I, what the next step in the process was? After I had the unlevered beta for the five businesses, I need to come up with weights for the five businesses, right? So now I'm going to move to the weights. But before I do that, any questions on the mechanics? Yes? So how do you that No, no, it's actually I just computed, right? There's cash. So you take the 7189 and divide it by the 112 you should get the 3%. So basically, I just pulled it off the comparable companies. Okay. This, exactly. So, so don't make up any stuff. You're going to get into serious trouble if you're making up some step in the process. Use the comparable companies as your crutch. There's another question I'm waiting for, because it's a pretty obvious question that comes out of what I just did. What's the question? I mean, that's the question. What? I just divide the total debt of the entire sector by the total market cap. 
I come up with the debt to equity ratio. What that does is if you have one, if you have, let's say that you take the software business, you got one giant and lots of pygmies. So you got Microsoft. If I take the average across all of them, I'm weighting them all, but the business itself is really dominated by two or three big players. That aggregate number would reflect what they do, and that's weighted more than what all the small companies are doing. So that's the advantage of the aggregate. That's also the disadvantage, because your largest companies are going to be pulling the numbers. Yes? I'm not computing the weighted average at all. Right? When you say weighted average, I, none of these numbers are weighted. The aggregate acts like a weighted average because I'm just adding up the numbers. It does it itself, right? Because it ends up becoming a weighted average because my largest numbers then drive my debt to equity ratio. So I, I would never compute a weighted average for my beta because then I lose the law of large numbers working for me, right? Yes? Okay, there, that is one of the two questions. You know what, why I never touch outliers? You take the two outliers out. Two others will pop up now, right? Because everything is in the eye of the beholder. You know what's going to happen is you nibble away on either side of this. Before you know it, you're going to end up with a sample size of three, which will give you the beta that you wanted to get in the first place. Do not mess with data. It's not a good idea. I know it sounds, you know, just take this one out, okay? If you just take outliers out of one side of the deal and you leave the outliers on the other side, you're already biasing. If you take outliers on both sides out, you're very quickly going to start to narrow your sample down to companies that are kind of in the middle. So I never mess with outliers. If you have outliers, let the numbers deal with them. So that's why I use the median. I'm not throwing anything out. And if you want to leave the outliers in affecting your numbers, use the weighted average, the, the aggregate numbers, basically, that you get. I was one question. What's the other? Yep. Are there some trees where you can just kind of certain amount of cash? Yeah, you could. But again, the fact, even if you have to keep the cash, where is it usually kept? It's probably invested in something liquid and riskless, right? That's the essence of cash. So even if you need to keep cash for a business, that cash is invested in places where you know what return you're going to make. So this is not about do I need the cash? Do I, it's not about excess cash for, or operating cash. It's about is it a cash? Uh, you know, what's the effect of having a big cash driven business? That cash is going to weigh the beta down because it's in safe places. Okay, I'm going to ask the question because you haven't asked the question yet. What did I do? I computed the average or the median for the whole sector and I unlevered using the median debt to equity ratio and the median beta. I've set you up. So, what's the question? Could I have done this for each company? I could have unlevered the beta for each company, right? I have a debt to equity ratio, I have a cash. I could have done what I did for the sector for each company. Why didn't I do it? Because I'd then get an unlevered beta for each company. Why didn't I do that instead of using the industry averages? One is I'm lazy, right? That's a lot more calculation. But in a spreadsheet, it really isn't, right? It's just one more column. You set up the equation to compute. There's a simple rule in statistics that if you have a noisy number, you don't want to do operations on that noisy number. You're saying, what are you talking about? You say the individual regression betas are kind of screwed up. If I take a screwed up regression beta and I unlever it and I adjust for cash, if it starts off as a screwed up number, it'll get even more screwed up by the time I'm done. So what I'm trying to do is use the law of large numbers first before I do operations on it because I trust the averages more. It actually is one of those amazing coincidences where being lazy actually works out in your favor. So rather than unlever each company's beta, I take that the entire sector and work with it. So now I have the unlevered beta for each of the five businesses. I need to get values for these. Again, I went back to what Disney told me about these five companies. They gave me the revenues for each business, right? Now, I could just use the revenue weights, and if I do that, I'm implicitly assuming that revenues and value are proportionate, that if I have high revenues in a business, and that generally is not true across businesses for a simple reason. Businesses vary in terms of margins and growth. The theme park business delivers very different margins than the broadcasting business. So I'd like to convert the revenues into value if I could, and I think I can. If you remember, when I did my studio business in the last column, what did I compute? 
the multiple of revenues that companies in the studio business typically traded, right? And if you look at the median value, I got 3.05. The typical movie business trades at three times revenues. And I can do this for every single sector. I did that for every single sector. There's the multiple. So the theme park business, the broadcasting business, the movie business all trade at three times revenues. The consumer products business, given its status, trades at a much lower multiple of revenues, 0.85 times revenues, and the interactive gaming business falls somewhere in the middle. If I multiply Disney's, rev Disney's revenues by business by that multiple, I come up with an estimated value for each business. I'm going to use those estimated values to come up with my weights. So all I'm doing is take my revenues, applying that multiple to come up with an estimated value to come up with the values. Yes? You can, but remember, you need that metric broken down by business. Then you need EBITDA by business, and then you're trusting accountants on allocations and stuff. So the more you trust accountants, the further down the income statement you can go. But you'll never, you probably would not find much beyond EBITDA. Companies don't break down net income level, operating income. So if you can use any multiple to essentially do it. You can even do book value and apply a multiple of book value. But make sure that, that all of the businesses, you're applying a metric that actually makes sense across the company. So I have estimated values for each of the five businesses. If I add up those estimated values, I come up with 135 billion. You know, analysts, when they value companies on the Wall Street Journal, you'll hear this talk about a company is worth more as the sum of its parts than as a company. You see, and a lot of this is very loose talk. But when you read it, you think analysts have actually valued each company, each part of the company seriously, and they've added them all up and come up with the sum of the parts valuation that is higher. Actually, that's not what they're doing. We just did a sum of the parts valuation of Disney. If you can go, it's like a back of the envelope, sum of the parts valuation, right? Because what have I done? I've applied a multiple. It's actually not even a valuation. It's a pricing of each business based on what other people are paying for similar businesses. I'm adding all of those numbers up. And I'm going to compare this 135 billion to whatever Disney is trading at right now. And if Disney were trading at 80 billion, I'm going to tell you the sum of the parts of Disney is worth a lot more than what it's trading at. So go buy Disney and break it up. And you see how dangerous this advice is? Because I'm asking you to do something immense based on the back of the envelopes calculation. You're saying, what, what choice do you have? You could actually seriously value each business, building from the base up, the cash flows. But here, we're doing a sum of the parts because our intent at this moment is just at least get a sense of the pricing of each business and use it to come up with the weights. It's better than using revenue weights. That's, that's the only argument I will make for it. I'm not saying it's a perfect measure of value. Of course, it's not. But now I have weights. And based on my breakdown of the, of the five businesses, Disney is almost 50% broadcasting about 34% theme parks, about 13.5% movies, and the rest are just these dregs that come in, the consumer products and gaming. Now, if you take the broadcasting business, 50%, where's most of that 50% coming from? Which part of the broadcasting business? ESPN. And this is, I think, one of the things about acquisition. Sometimes the things you don't anticipate are going to have value are the ones that actually do the deal, make the deal for you. ESPN is a cash machine for Disney. It's a cash machine that's running into some trouble, but let's break that down. Why is ESPN a cash machine for Disney? How many of you have cable? Okay. Already you can see why ESPN is in trouble. Because 10 years ago, I've asked you how many of you have cable. No, almost everybody would have put up their hand. If you have cable, you pay, what, $70 a month, $75 for the cable company to deliver all those channels that you never watch. So if you are subscribed to Verizon Fios and you, or, or to Time Warner and you get the cable package, Time Warner delivers 700 channels to you. How does Time Warner get the right to carry these channels? It pays each of these channel companies a certain amount to carry. So somebody like the Food Network, it might pay 50 cents a month to carry. And that might be too high, 25 cents a month. Somebody like CW, they might carry 3 cents, 5 cents a month. You know how much they pay ESPN every month out of that cable? About $6 of every cable bill paid in the US every month goes to ESPN. Now do you see what's a cash cow? 
basically it is, I mean, let's face it, ESPN is the only thing standing between cable and the abyss. Because okay? 10 years ago, what, what, what was the cable channel, what was the cable sales pitch? If you don't have us, you have to put a little antenna and watch the three local channels. You need us. And then came Netflix and Amazon Prime and the rest. Streaming has kind of undercut the need to carry cable. It's the only thing that you need cable for. What's, what's the one thing that you still cannot get consistently? It's live sports. And even there, you're starting to see a break. I'm a baseball fan. I don't need cable because I have MLB. I pay $119 a year, and I can watch every baseball game if I want. I can split my screen and watch the Red Sox lose and the Yankees win every day. And if it's reversed, then I go back and watch yesterday's games to make sure I get the right combination there. I can watch four games, especially towards the end of every season. But the NFL remains a holdout. The NFL is actually almost primitive in what it makes you watch, right? I'm now in San Diego. Guess who I get to watch? The nearest team, which in this case is the LA whatever, you know, whether it's the Rams or whoever else moves into LA in the next few. I have to watch those. But if you want to watch live sports, you need cable. Now do you see why ESPN has tremendous bargaining power? But it's kind of a mixed blessing for ESPN. They're a cash cow, but they also realize the cash cow is getting thinner. Why? Because look at how many people don't have cable. My oldest son doesn't have cable. He's not at cable because he never watches live sports. My second son, if he comes home and we have no cable, we'll leave immediately and go stay at a hotel. Because <laughs> if he can't watch NFL on Sunday, there, you know, he's saying, I, I can't live here. This is you know, not civilized. <laughs> but if the NFL figures out a way, and it's going to happen very soon, of charging you for an NFL package where you can do what you do in ML. In fact, the question is, why hasn't the NFL actually done it yet? Because they too are in golden handcuffs. Their, their contracts with, you know, give them so much money, they don't want to mess with it. But the world is shifting under them. So that was a long way of saying that 49%, a big chunk of it comes from ESPN, and that portion is probably going to get smaller over time. So if you take those weights, and the weights always have to add up to 100%, that's the only requirement, so make sure that that's happening. And you take the weighted average of the unlevered betas we got from a couple of pages ago, I get an unlevered beta for Disney's operations, and I'll tell you why I use that word. Disney's operating business is of 0.92. That is my unlevered beta for Disney, given the business itself. You think, what do you mean, this is operations? Well, Disney does have a cash balance, right? So if you ask me what's your unlevered beta for Disney as a company, not just its operations, I'm going to bring in how much cash they have, 3.93 billion. The cash has a beta of zero. The weight, it's that weighted average concept. We go back to it over and over again. My unlevered beta for Disney as a company with the cash included would be about 0.90. Imagine doing this for Apple. What businesses is Apple in? It's in the smartphone business. That's about 75% of its value. Computers are about 15% of the value. 10% comes from services, software, et cetera. Entertainment is so tiny, you can't even count it. But maybe you can count 1% for entertainment. That's the Apple Plus, et cetera, coming up. If I take a weighted average of the betas of those businesses, I'm going to come up with an unlevered beta for Apple's operating businesses. If you ask me what's the unlevered beta for Apple, the company, I now have to bring in the 250 billion in cash they have, because that has a beta of zero. But always do it in two steps, because the operating business beta is the one we're going to use through much of our analysis. Because why are we doing this? We're coming up with a hurdle rate, right? I don't need a hurdle rate for cash. The hurdle rate for cash is just on the table rate, right? So that part I don't worry about, but it's good to be able to see where betas for companies come from. So I've got my weight, weighted average, and you can see that that weighted average of unlevered beta is what I'm going to do from this point on. If you ask me, what's the unlevered beta for Disney's operating businesses? You're going to see the point 0.9239 pop up. Any questions on this step in the process? You've got the unlevered beta for your businesses. If you're desperate, use revenue weights. If you can convert the revenues into value, I think it's better because you get value weights. And to do it, you just have to get. So when you download the data for your peer group from Capital IQ, 
download all the numbers I did for the studio business, market cap, total debt, you know, cash, do it all in one go, so it's all in one spreadsheet, so you're not going back and forth, the, the sample could change, your market cap should cha could change. And also compute those enterprise value to sales ratios, they're ready to go when you want to convert your revenues into value. So everybody comfortable with the waiting? Now comes the last step. I need to bring in debt into this process. Now, I could ask Disney how much debt they have, but they tell me already it's a public company. Their market cap is out there, and their total debt I can get from their financial statements. So if you ask me what the debt to equity ratio is for Disney as a company, they're 15.96 billion debt. And I'll take you to the mechanics of how I came up with that number from the balance sheet debt. It's a relatively simple number to come up with for the entire company. The market cap for the company is 121 billion. Again, that's a share price times number of shares. So the debt to equity ratio for Disney as a company is about 13.1%. That I know. But I need debt and equity ratios for each of the five businesses. And here you can already see the challenge I'm going to face. Why is it going to be difficult to get debt to equity ratios by business? First, I don't have a market value of equity of each business. I have to allocate the market value of equity, right? Second, when you look at Disney's balance sheet and they say debt, they don't say theme park debt, broadcasting business debt. They don't break the debt down by business. I have to try to guess what each business carries as debt. So I'll tell you what I did in the, so this is the fourth edition of the Applied Corporate Finance book, four slices of Disney. When I did this first for Disney in 1997, I took the lazy way out. What's the lazy way out? I said, they don't give me the data, so I'm going to assume that every business has the same debt to equity ratio, which is an extremely lazy thing to do. And people pointed it out, and I said, you're right, I shouldn't be doing that. Because when I do that, I'm making the theme park business borrow as much money as the broadcasting business, and that doesn't seem right. So I said, maybe I can start making judgment calls here, because doing the company's debt to equity ratio is a judgment call too, and it's not a very good judgment. So here's what I did. I took the total debt of 15.96 billion, and I looked for a basis for allocating that debt across businesses. Now, the basis I used might not be the basis you use, so don't think of this as a final answer. I said, usually, debt goes into physical assets. You don't borrow money for intangible, because bankers don't like to lend on intangible. It goes into physical assets. And Disney broke down what they called their identifiable assets. I'll be quite honest. I don't know what they mean by identifiable, but I'm assuming they can see something in there, so it's not kind of a fuzzy goodwill kind of number. They broke it down by business. I allocated my 15.96 billion across the businesses based on identifiable assets. Now, you might choose something different. If they give you depreciation by business, you might say depreciation goes with physical assets. I'm going to use the proportion. That use, I mean, you're saying, how do I know I'm right? I don't, but nobody does. You're making your best judgment. You're saying, I want something that makes sense to allocate. So basically, I've got the debt allocated by business. You're saying, how do you come up with the estimated equity? Remember the values that I came up for each of the businesses based on that very simplistic pricing? I use those values to allocate my market value of equity across the five business, saying, if the market is right, 49% of Disney's market value of equity must come from the broadcasting business, so I broke equity down. You're saying you're stretching. Yeah, I'm stretching to the point of breaking, but I'll keep stretching. Because what's your alternative is to use some rough number across the businesses. I now have a debt to equity ratio for each business. I'm almost home. I've got the unlevered beta for each business from part one. I have the value of each business from part two. I have the debt to equity ratio from each business from what I just did. I do a levered beta, not just for Disney as a company, but for each of the five businesses. Don't forget the end game here. We're doing all of this, why? Because we need a hurdle rate. So the hurdle rate is the risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium, and if I use my risk-free rate, which was 2.75% in November of 2013, and my equity risk premium, which reflects where Disney does business, I come up with the cost of equity for each of the five businesses and the cost of equity for Disney as a company. I know this sounds incredibly grinding, and you're saying, sounds like a lot of work. If you run a multi-business company, if you don't do this step, I think you're doomed, and I'll explain in a minute why. 
you need to break down businesses, you need to come up with costs of equity for each business, because this is now going to become the basis for your decision making. Yes? Um, the consumer products uh, with debt equity of 170. You're saying, why does it, Disney's consumer product business is now a licensing business. Oh, it's now. Right? It's now. So, but basically, it, you know, even in 2013, they moved into a licensing business about 15 years ago because they didn't want to deal with the production and the inventory. So it's now almost a pure licensing business, which means the licensing revenues are pretty stable. It's not a huge amount of debt because remember, it's a tiny slice of the company. But they can afford to borrow a ton of money against those revenues because they're predictable. Yes? If you, if you remember, I got the value, you, you remember how I got those? That gave me proportions that I attached to Disney. I took those proportions and I attached them to my market value of equity. So remember, my, I, my estimate is broadcasting is 49.27%, 49.27% of 121. So basically, I'm just allocating the value of my business across the five businesses and then saying, okay, let's figure out how much is debt and how much is equity. So I'm, that's why I'm saying I'm building on assumptions on top of assumptions because otherwise I can't even get them. This is not just Disney specific. Any time I have a multi-business company, I will have to do that unless you have a company, and this is very unusual, that actually tells you which divisions carry how much debt. United Technologies, for instance, breaks down their debt by business. That's very unusual. If you have that, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Say, okay, I know the debt, but you still have to allocate the equity across the five businesses to come up with the debt to equity ratio. So now I'm going to use this table. You stay on the table in the previous page because we're going to do some role playing here. Okay? I'm going to give you two choices of roles. I'll take the, the other role. You can either be the CFO of Disney or you can be head of Disney movies. Which would you rather be? You can take either one. I'll take the other one. I can be the bad guy or the good guy. You want to be the head of the movie business? Fine, sounds like more fun. You hang out at the Beverly Hills Hilton and people come and pitch ideas. You have a very, you have a very glamorous life after all. You, know. you don't hang out in Burbank at all. It's so boring you go to Hollywood. So you're the movie guy at Disney and I'm the CFO of Disney and you come to me with a new movie proposal. Let's make it big and let's make it shocking. Lone Ranger 2, this time without Johnny Depp. Remember Lone Ranger 1? Uh, Disney spent almost $200 million making that movie. And already you can say, what were you thinking? Making a movie about a hero with a Native American as a sidekick already sounds like a fraught story. And then to make that guy, the, the sidekick, Johnny Depp, makes it even more dicey. Because when you see Johnny Depp, what do you think? I, I know what I think. When I see Johnny Depp, no matter which movie, I think Drunken Pirate. <laughs> no matter what role he's playing. I remember run, I was actually in a hotel in Prague and I was taking the elevator up and there was a guy who looked like a drunken pirate. I said, that guy looks like Johnny Depp. Then I discovered it was Johnny Depp. He was at the hotel. He was actually playing music for money because he'd been bankrupt. He'd been rendered bankrupt because he'd been sued by multiple people. Drunken Pirate, Astanto, this movie was destined to go nowhere. And surprise, it went nowhere. It lost Disney, I think, $200 million. They wrote off the $200 million. So now you come up with Lone Ranger 2 without Johnny Depp. What's my first reaction? Get out of here. You've already lost us $200 million. You cockamamie Lone Ranger ideas. Go find another superhero. Why don't you talk to the Avengers guys? Get one of those throwaway heroes from there. They'll do better than the Lone Ranger. But he said, no, no, this time we've looked at the numbers, which tells me a little bit about last time, but let's not go there. He said, I've looked at the numbers, and I think we can generate a return on equity of 9.5%. No movie guy ever talks like this. <laughs> we've hired five MBAs out of UCLA. This was a summer internship. They looked at the numbers. I think we can make a 9.5% return on equity. Let's say I trust your MBAs. And the 9.5% return on equity is a reasonable estimate of what this movie can make. So I have a very simple question. If 9.5% is the return on equity in this movie, should I take it? You see why I picked 9.5%? Go back to the previous page. What am I asking you? 
what should I be comparing my 9.5% return in equity to? Because I'll give you two choices. If I compare to the cost of equity for the company, which is 8.5%, it looks like a good project. But if I compare to the cost of equity for the movie business, where the cost of equity is 9.9%, it doesn't look like a good project. So basically the question I'm asking is if I have the return in equity on a project, should I be comparing the cost of equity for the company, after all the company is coming up with the money, or should I be looking at the risk of the business the project is in to come up with the cost of equity? This is one of the most consequential questions for multi-business companies. And you're going to see why, because if you get the wrong answer, I'm going to take it to its logical limit and we'll see what happens to companies. How many of you think I should use the cost of equity for the company and take the project? Okay, so I'm going to use it. I mean, to use it as a guinea pig, but maybe I do. Let's carry this forward. So you'll use the cost of equity for all five businesses, right? Yeah. So you'll use 8.5%. Which businesses are going to be happy about this decision we've made and which ones are going to get pissed off? There are five businesses here. Edict passes. Everybody uses 8.5% cost of equity from this day on. Which of the five businesses is going to be happy about this choice? All the riskier businesses are going to say, this is great, we're part of the Disney family. <laughs> and all of the safe businesses are going to be pissed off. You're saying, hey, that's what I'm CEO for, I piss off people, okay. But it's not just pissed off, right? Let's carry this to the next step. When you look at projects, what are the risky businesses going to find? A lot more projects now because you've lowered their cost of equity. And what are the safe businesses going to find? They're not able to take as many projects. So over time, if I track the five businesses, guess what you're going to see happening? The riskier businesses are going to get bigger, and the safe businesses are going to get smaller, and they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Why is it the wrong reason? Why are the risky businesses able to enjoy lower cost of equity? Because they're being subsidized by the safe businesses. And what am I doing to my safe businesses? I'm shrinking and killing them. And if I track this business five years out, guess what I'm going to find? The companies become riskier. The safe businesses have shrunk. And if I do this long enough, the safe businesses are going to go away. And who's going to subsidize you? You've essentially destroyed the firm because you've allowed the safe businesses to subsidize risky businesses. It happens all the time. Bankers Trust started in the 1980s as a commercial bank. By 1990, Bankers Trust was almost entirely an investment bank. Why? Because through the 80s, Bankers Trust played a really stupid game. They said, we're going to allocate equity to whichever business has a higher return equity. Commercial banking was investment banking. Investment banking said, we can make 12% return. And Bankers Trust said, okay, you get all the equity. They took the money out of the commercial banking business, put it into investment banking. Why? Because the commercial banking business was what was pulling the cost of equity for the company down. But over time, the commercial banking business died, and all they had was an investment banking business built on sand, because it wasn't earning the return it needed to make without the subsidies. And you're not alone. Half of all multi-business companies use one hurdle rate. The minute somebody says, corporate cost of capital, already the game is lost, because when you have a corporate cost of capital, you think you can take it and attach it to every project you take? What well, that really doesn't make any sense. The discount rate for a project should reflect the risk of the project. And if, at least at a generic level, to the degree that the business is carrying that risk, you want the risk of the business. So why do you think half of all businesses? This seems like common sense. That if you're multi-business companies, your hurdle rate should be higher for the riskier businesses you're in and lower for the safer ones. This isn't even rocket science or CAPM or any you know, modern portfolio theory. This is how multi-business companies should always be run. So what's the reason you think so many companies end up with one cost of capital across the whole company? There must be a reason. At least I keep hoping. Yeah. Okay, so their one argument they make is, we raise it from equity investors who attach a cost to us based on our perceived risk. As long as we beat that, what's the big deal? Could the perceived risk shift over time? If I'm bankers trust, I'm investors. You're right. It's a kind of an implicit agreement you've entered in with investors when you raise that equity, which is we're not doing anything within the business to make ourselves riskier. So I supply you with the equity. And what do you do? You take my equity, 
and you start to do crazier and riskier things on the side, I might not notice initially, I might reward you, until those crazy and riskier things start to show up in your numbers, and they will, right? Your earnings will start to become more volatile and say, what the hell happened? You're going to take a big trading loss, and I never expected that to happen. So you're right. Initially, you can say, hey, who's going to notice? I've raised the equity. They thought I was a safe company. But that can't last for very long before the reality kicks in. How do most companies get a cost of equity? They have a risk free rate that they must sometimes play games with that they look up. An equity risk premium that they might get from somebody, a service. And then they have a beta for a company. How do we say most people get betas? They get them from a regression. If the only way you can get betas is from a regression, you're already trapped, right? The only beta I can get for Disney is for Disney as a company. There's no Disney entertainment, Disney. The only reason our betas reach the five businesses is because I built up to the beta from the ground up. The first problem that will get in your way is you estimate betas from a regression for your company. GE has one beta, and you're going to be using that beta for 26 different businesses. Disaster is waiting to happen. It might take 20 years. In the case of GE, that's what it took before the whole thing blows up on you. You know, the second reason companies don't like to even talk about this is it's political. You don't want to bring up the issue of different hurdle rates within the company because you always get a backlash. I'll give you a story. About 30 years ago, a student from this class went to work for The Gap. It was a growing business then. It was going into two new areas because when he first went to work for The Gap, The Gap was just The Gap. Every investment looked like the, the old one. Another Gap store in a mall. And then the Gap decided that they were going to open two new divisions. One was Banana Republic, and the other was Old Navy. So think about what we talked about in the context of betas. You got Gap, Banana Republic, Old Navy. If you think in terms of underlying businesses and riskiness, which one of these should have the lowest beta and the lowest cost of equity, and which one should have the highest? Let's start with the lowest. Which of these? You've all been in a Gap, an Old Navy, and a Banana Republic at some point in time, right? I mean, so they're shrinking so fast. We say, what's a Gap? Okay. Yeah. It's not just the announcement on the London Underground saying, watch the Gap. I always thought it was a great ad for the Gap, right? Which should have the lowest beta? Old Navy, right? Because you have low prices, you basically can find you know, khakis for $20, $25. Then you'd have the gap. And Banana Republic is just gap clothes marked up by about 30% without the riffraff hanging around you. Have you ever walked into that Banana Republic store on Bleecker? There's never anybody there. I just walk in to say, has anybody ever come in here? <laughs> so this is when they started. So this guy called me. He was very excited about, about the idea. He's going to apply corporate finance. He said he took me through this process of the three businesses. And he said, what do you think about this idea? We should have a high cost of equity for Banana Republic when they take a store. You know, you know, so we're using 18% as our corporate hurdle rate. So where did that come from? I don't know. It was here when I got here. And let's face it, a lot of corporate hurdle rates come out of nowhere. You have no idea. You know. But he said, no, we should probably be using 21% for Banana Republic and 15% for Old Navy. I said, that sounds sensible. He said, well, I'm going to bring it up at the next divisional head meeting. I knew exactly what he was walking into, but I didn't want to give him the bad news. I said, tell me what happens after you've made this pitch. So a week later, he calls me and says, I, did the, I, I made my presentation about different divisions using different costs of equity. And it did not go over well. I said, why? He said, one of the divisional heads really did not like the idea. I said, let me guess. Was it the Banana Republic guy? He said, yes, you know. Banana Republic guy said, this is a terrible idea. He said, we're part of the Gap family. He suddenly discovered the family feeling. He said, this is not fair. You're treating me different than my siblings. We should all have the same cost of equity. And I said, what did the CEO say? He said, the CEO really likes Banana Republic as a division. He wants it to grow. And he understands the logic, but he doesn't want to rock the boat right now. Let's leave the cost of equity at 18% was his final conclusion. And this happens in multi-business company after multi-business company. Somebody starts a conversation, a sensible one of asking, should we have different costs of equity? It's amazing how much pushback you get. 
from your riskiest divisions. And since your riskiest divisions happen to be your growth divisions, your star divisions, they're run by the most overconfident person in the whole company probably, you end up not wanting to push back. And then you build this foundation for what long term is always going to be a mistake in one direction, which is your riskiest businesses are going to overinvest and your safest business are going to underinvest. So my argument for bottom-up betas is not just that they're more precise, that they're more forward-looking, and that you can get, but I need them for multi-business companies. I cannot run a multi-business company without having a sense of the differences in risk across these businesses. Okay. So let's try this on my other companies. And you're going to see, and I won't torture you by going through the whole details like I did for Disney. I did this for Vale. They broke themselves down to four businesses, metals and mining, iron ore, fertilizers, and logistics. For my comparable companies, for each of these, I went global. Why? Because at first, if I stayed with just Brazilian companies, you can see my sample size is going to be tiny. And second, if you're an iron ore company, it really doesn't matter where you are. Ultimately, you sell into a global market. And the advantage of going global is my sample size explodes to really big numbers. I did exactly what I did for Disney. I looked up the regression beta, I cleaned up for the betas. I came up with an unlevered beta for each of the four businesses using the median beta, the median debt to equity. So take the studio entertainment, work it out, and did this for each of them. I've got an unlevered beta. I took a weighted average based on the values that I came up. And based on my estimate of values, at least, Vale is about 76% iron ore, about 17% metals and mining, about 5% fertilizers, and about 2% logistics. There's a transportation business within Vale. The weighted average that I get for Vale as a company is 0.844. So exactly what I did for Disney on these four businesses. I brought those businesses into my, into my unlevered beta calculation. And here, I did something slightly different than what I did for Disney. Remember for Disney, I took the debt and I tried to allocate it across the different businesses. I did a little dance on using the allocation. Here, I'm not even going to waste my time doing it. And here's my rationale. These are all big infrastructure business com investment com businesses. I don't see any intuitive rationale for why the debt in my logistics business would be very different from the debt in my iron ore business. Maybe I'm wrong. But if there's going to be no big differences, why waste time allocating debt? So if you're a manufacturing company, you need three manufacturing businesses, I might say, look, it's not way worth the trouble. I gave them all the same debt to equity ratio, 55%. I come up with a levered beta, and I chose to do my entire analysis in US dollars for two reasons. One is, you know, Brazilian rias are kind of messy, but the second is these are commodity businesses. And one of the things you will see about commodity businesses, no matter where they are in the world, is that financials are actually reported in US dollars. It's, it actually is easier for me to do everything in dollars. I don't have to do any conversions. Where does that show up? My risk free rate is the USD bond rate. There's my beta by business. There's my risk free rate. The equity risk premium reflects where Vale does business. Remember, 37% of its revenues come from China. So that's in there. And there's my cost of equity by business. In the case of Vale, you can see that the cost of equities are more bunched up. If Vale uses one co corporate cost of equity across the board, the consequences will be smaller because the businesses are more convergent. The more divergent your businesses become, the more you have to worry about differences in hurdle rates across the businesses, the more it makes sense to then come up with the cost of equity for each business. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, is the revenue mix across the See, the that's a good question because I've used that same revenue mix for all the five, for all four businesses. You know, I'm kind of stymied on that one. On the footnotes, where did I get the revenue mix for for uh, Vale? I looked at their financials, and the footnote they gave me the breakdown. They don't actually break it down by business. If they did break it down by business and say our logistics business is entirely Brazil. And our INO business is 53% in China. I could actually compute equity risk premiums for each business, which are different for each business, but it's an informational constraint. For most businesses, you're not going to see that breakdown. Now, incidentally, if you decide to change your mind with Vale and do everything in RIAs, 
There are two ways you can do it. One is you can do the whole thing from scratch, but that's a lot of work. But you can actually take your US dollar cost of equity and convert it into a nominal REI cost of equity using that little trick we already have used with risk-free rates, which is if I know the difference in inflation rates between the two currencies, in this case, I've assumed a 9% inflation rate for, um, in, in, in REIs and 2% in dollars. You know, I end up with a cost of equity nominal REIs of about 8 So I've taken the US dollar cost of equity for the company and just scaled it up to reflect the higher inflation in REIs. If you're in a hurry, you can just add the difference. It should be pretty close. Right? But that cost of equity would be a nominal REI cost of equity. And alternatively, you can just say, I'm going to come up with a risk-free rate in REIs and build up to it. The answers will be different, but not that different. So make a choice on the currency. But if you change your mind later in the process, you can always switch currencies. It's just the inflation difference that has to play out. For Tata Motors and Baidu, my life got a little simpler. Why? Because I put each company into one business. Tata Motors, I said, was an automobile company. Notice I didn't say an Indian automobile company because it's, that's not even true anymore with Jaguar Land Rover. So the beta that I used was the beta for global automobile companies. There were 86, uh, 76 companies in my sample. There's my unlevered beta. There's no waiting to do. That's one of the advantages of single business companies is it's in one business. It's 100% in that business. I use the 0.86. You're saying, if it's a single business company, why even do bottom-up betas? You still get the savings in standard error, right? It's got nothing to do with the business mix changing. So that 0.86 unlevered beta is what I used as my starting beta. I used Tata Motors, marginal tax rate. 32.45% was the marginal tax rate in India. And Tata Motors debt to equity ratio to come up with a levered beta. That levered beta gives me a cost of equity in rupee terms of 14.49%. What is it that makes it a rupee cost of equity? I started with a rupee risk free rate. But I'm essentially staying consistent to exactly what I did at Disney, but it's a little easier here because I'm in a single business. Baidu, I put in the online advertising company, but you're saying it's a search engine. Search engine is not a business. Social media is not a business. A business is how you make money. Facebook is in the online advertising business. So is Google. So I used online advertising companies, and I found 42 global online companies, online advertising companies. Their unlevered beta is 1.30. I used that unlevered beta, but I used Baidu's tax rate and Baidu's debt to equity ratio to come up with a levered beta. And I computed a cost of equity. And remember, based on a risk-free rate. So basically, once I make that currency choice, my risk-free rate is driven by it. But my beta and my equity risk premium reflect essentially what I'd have done with any other currency. Yes. Yeah, that's actually a good question. In a perfect world, in fact, this is going to be true for all of the things I've done so far, right? Because when I took the 10 movie studio companies, I was implicitly assuming that the only business they were was in the movie business. When I took the 27 broad, I did the same thing. Technically, I'd love to live in a world where I could find pure play companies. But if I put 100% requirement in every company, my sample size is going to go towards zero very quickly. So here's where I get down on my knees and I look up and say, please let the law of large numbers bail me out. And here's how it's going to work. Let's say I find 27 broadcasting companies, and each of them has, a, has another business on the side. Not always the same business. All I'm hoping and praying is that second business or third business they have on the side is sometimes going to increase the beta and sometimes going to decrease the beta. Because then, as my sample size increases, I'm getting rid of that side business. You're right. In a perfect world, you want pure play. But we don't live in that world. We've got to take what we can. So I just take companies which are put primarily in a business. And remember, you're, if you use a database like S&P Capital, like you, you're at the mercy of what they put this company in. So my defense is these are, none of these are pure. But maybe the average will be pure, even though the pieces are not pure. Right. Any other questions? Yes? I have a previous slide. When we assume the 9.5% return of the Disney... No, no, you're right. That's an estimate. No, so that is only for that segment because I'm assuming the theme park... No, no, wait. wait the 9.5% is on a single movie. So think of it as doing capital budgeting in the movie. You project out gate receipts. You project out side revenues. So I'm not sure what you mean by other. So basically, this is what you get by projecting what you get for an individual movie. Will the other divisions also make money from the movie? 
Okay, that's a good question. Are you saying, did I count that as part of my net income? In other words, you're looking for an excuse to take the project, right? Because, I mean, this is basically what had happened. If you have an animated movie business, and it's a good point, right? If you have an animated movie like, oh, what's, what's the newest uh, Pixar one? Upward, onward, inward, whatever it is, right? No. And let's say the return equity in that movie was less than the cost of equity. The Pixar guy would have come to me and said, but look at how many toys you can sell in your toy stores. Maybe you will have an onward section in a, in a theme park. My response is, remember we said there's no garnishing allowed in investing? Because this is garnishing. You're saying, just take it, the merchandising will take care of it. If you truly believe there's a merchandising side benefit, you know what I'm going to ask you to do? I'm going to ask you to add the merchandising to your income. If you want to get fancy, we'll compare the return on equity on that to the cost of equity for merchandising. But I would just add it on to this and say, my return equity with that included is 10.7%. That's higher than my 9.9%. I'm going to take it. So I'm not rejecting any story you can tell me about side benefits, but I'm going to hold you accountable and say, let's put the numbers in there, because otherwise I'm letting you overwrite the numbers by using a buzzword, right? And merchandising is a big buzzword at, at Disney, I'm sure, for any movie saying, hey, just trust us. People will buy Johnny Depp characters in plastic, no, no, whatever, and that'll make up for the fact that it's a really bad movie. Then I got to Deutsche Bank. And I'm going, to do, I'm going to take you through how I computed the beta for Deutsche Bank. And if you notice something different about how I compute this beta versus the other companies, let me know. So here's what I did. I broke Deutsche Bank into two businesses, commercial banking and investment banking. Okay. I looked up publicly traded companies for so commercial banking. I looked at European banks. Why not global banks? because much of the commercial banking part of, of Deutsche is Europe-based. Right? The, the, what they do outside Europe is more the investment banking, merchant banking, but the commercial banking, I looked at European banks. I came up with 84 banks, so quite enough so I could just take those 84 banks. I took the average beta, and I used that as the beta for banking. For investment banks, I look for global investment banks. Why? Because there are very few European investment banks. Most European investment banking is done by the banks themselves, European banks themselves. So you had to go to Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, etc. So you had to go outside. I found about 58 global investment banks. I came up with the beta, and I took the average beta, and I made that the beta for banking. And then I took a weighted average based on how much Deutsche made in Revenues, but revenues for a bank is not like revenues for a manufacturing company. It's like you know, commercial banking. It's that interest spread they make, the difference between revenues. What am I, what's the step that I'm skipping here that I did for the other companies? I get the comparable companies. I take the average beta, and I use that average beta. What did I not do? I didn't unlever and relever. And my advice to you is you, you shouldn't be doing a bank to begin with because if you took my advice, it says stay away from banks. You know why I'm not unlevering and relevering for a bank? What's debt for a bank? Debt for a manufacturing company is a source of capital. Debt for a bank is like raw material, right? You borrow at four, you lend out at five, you make a 1% difference. And defining debt for a bank is a nightmare. Because technically, those deposits that customers make in a Citibank, it are, it's debt, right? Because it is a contractual obligation. You got, if it's a CD, you've got to pay the interest. And if I define that as debt, you know what the debt ratio for a bank will look like? 97% debt, 3% equity. And that's kind of absurd. They're not using debt as capital to run a business. They're using debt as raw material. Unlevering and relevering betas is impossible to do with financial service companies. So I just skipped the step. I assume the average equity beta for banks is the equity beta. I am implicitly assuming then that the risk of equity in a bank is roughly the same across companies. That could get me into trouble because we know some banks are riskier than others. But what makes them riskier is not that they've borrowed more money, but because their regulatory capital might have fallen to a dangerously low level. We'll talk about adjusting for that later when we get to a point where we want to talk about that. But here I'm just going to take the easy way out and take the, weight, the, uh, the, the levered betas. And those levered betas give me a cost of equity for Deutsche. And I'm not even going to bother computing a cost of capital for Deutsche because, as I said, if you can't define debt, 
a cost of capital is a meaningless number. So when banks talk about their cost of capital, they're already using the long, wrong language. The only capital that banks raise is equity. So what they mean when they talk about cost of capital within a bank is a cost of equity. And might as well call it a cost of equity because that's really what you're nailing down here. I know it's been a lot of stuff today, but we're going to take, in the, take a little slightly easier route here. One of the advantages of bottom-up betas is I can now estimate a beta for a private company, a division of a company, because I'm not constrained by running a regression. So I'm going to talk about how to compute the beta for, because remember, I have one company in my sample. That's a private business, right, Bookscape? And I can't run a regression, I can, but I can get a bottom-up beta. So I'll give you a little bit of a history of how this company actually ended up becoming part of my, my class. So this was about you know, 20 years ago. I was sitting in my office. This lady comes in, and she says, you know, I, you know I, I run a business in New York, and I need some help. And I've been told that you teach corporate finance. I tried to get away and said, I teach marketing. <laughs> but she didn't believe me. So, she, she, so I said, OK. What do we, and she, she said she ran a bookstore. And I said, no, I, know, I, I like bookstores. I said, that's good. And she said she inherited from a grandfather who gave it to a father, and now she was running it. And she said, we're facing a fight or flee decision. I said, shouldn't you be going to the police about this? And she said, no, 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 it's not that kind of fight or flee. But here's the challenge. We've been in the same location for the last 50 years. We have a really good location in Manhattan. But a new Barnes & Noble is opening. This was when Barnes & Noble is coming out of you know, nowhere, opening chain stores, is opening two blocks away. And we have to decide whether to fight them or whether I should just walk away from this business and collect this $2 million that my landlord will give me for just giving up on the lease. I said, I still don't see what I have to do with this. And she said, here's what I have to do to fight Barnes & Noble. They have a cappuccino bar, and they have little couches set up. I don't have any of that stuff. I have to take the rest of my savings and invest it in the bookstore to make it look more upscale. And I have to decide whether that makes sense. And I said, I still don't see why you're coming to me. And she said, I need to know what return. She didn't use the word, but I need to know what I need to make on these savings for it to be good. In other words, she wanted a hurdle rate. To which your response is, how have you been running a business for 60 years without a hurdle rate? Lots of private businesses run on inertia, right? Somebody made a good decision 50 years ago. You're running on the fumes of that business. You never make big investments. So this notion of a hurdle rate doesn't even come up. She said, can you help me? And I said, yeah, I think I can. She gave me a coupon for like $100 worth of books. And I said, OK, that's good enough. <laughs> and then she left. And I said, I'll call, I'll call you soon. So I went to, to Bloomberg Terminal. And I looked for public, uh, no, book retailers. And I found one. So this is the update. But there were three then. Now there are only two. There were three book retailers. Sample size of three doesn't work, right? So I tried my first ploy go up and down the food chain, and I brought in publishers. I ended up with a sample of 11. And then I stopped with 11. Why? She gave me only a $100 coupon. I'm not going to work really hard. 11 is good enough. I looked up. I did exactly what I did for Disney. I came up with the, with the median beta, median debt. To, so essentially, think of what I did in the studio business. And I came up with an unlevered beta for being in the book business. Notice how I've described it, because I've retailers and publishing of 0.72. And I, I'm sorry, 0.76 after I clean up for cash. And I used that as my unlevered beta for Bookscape. Now, to get from an unlevered beta to a levered beta, what's the number I need? I need a debt to equity, and it's got to be market debt to equity, right? Now I run into my second problem. So I called her and I said, Do you have a target debt ratio? She said, A what? And I kind of hung up the phone. That kind of answered my question. Because if she said, I have a target debt ratio of 25%, I'd have just plugged in the 25% and moved on. I've never got an answer from a private business on this question that I can actually use. But I always have to make sure I ask. And I said, what do I do now? I could go with book debt to equity, right? Because I can get that. But then I'm trusting accountants at a private business to come up with book debt and equity. And I'm not even going to try to go there. So I cheated. I said, I don't know what the debt to equity ratio for this business is, but I know what it is for the typical publicly traded book company. It's 21.41%. I'm going to give them that debt to equity ratio. 
you see why I have to do this? I don't have a market debt target. I don't trust book values. They don't have a target. I'm going to, and that beta of 0.86 gives me a cost of equity of 7.46%. So I'm going to leave this as my last question for today. I've used a beta risk-free rate and an equity risk premium to come up with the cost of equity, right? I could call her and say, this is your cost of equity. But when I do that, I think I'm making a serious mistake. And here's why. What does beta measure? The risk you cannot diversify away. Why was I able to do that for public companies? Because I assume the marginal investor is diversified. So when I do this for Vale or Disney, I say, don't worry. The marginal investor is diversified. They'll get rid of the risk. But what did this lady say? She was going to take the rest of her savings and put it into the bookstore, which means she's going to be the exact opposite of diversified. She's going to be completely sunk into this broad investment. And that's going to be pretty true for almost every private business. So here's my last question. When I use that risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium, the 7.5%, am I going to underestimate a cost of equity or overestimate a cost of equity? I'm going to underestimate it. I'm going to leave that in suspense because I've not completed the rest. Because then I have to say, how am I going to adjust the cost of equity upwards? So after the quiz, the first, there will be class. And we will have this suspenseful question answered, so, you know, kind of get you to come back to class. We'll talk about adjusting cost of equity for private companies. Yeah. I have already done the regression beta for my project horizon. Mm -hmm. So after this class, I'm supposed actually supposed to do the bottom up, which will be better. Okay. Um, while, I, while I was doing the regression, I used, I found like the um, price change on Yahoo price, and I believe the adjusted closing price reflects the dividends already. So no, I, you need the dividends. I need, but, but you need to add the dividends in the month in which it comes out. So you need to go look up on Bloomberg yeah. when the dividends were paid on the stock and yeah. put them in the stock market. Oh, I actually have it. Okay. Have a dividends history, but with the um, SP 500, which I compare. They don't have the dividends they data. They do the same thing. It's on Bloomberg as well. Uh, on Bloomberg. In Bloomberg, look up the dividends per month. They will give you the dividends. Oh, okay. Cool. Thanks. I have just some yeah. small questions. So, because from the annual report of Verizon, I can only find the effective interest rate. Yeah, you always still have effective interest rate. Yeah. No, don't, don't worry about that. We haven't come to cost of oh, debt yet. Oh, okay. Right? That's not sure. a cost of debt. Okay. Yeah. And for the ten, so for the risk-free rate, because currently it's like really no, uh, but if I'm as estimating from this point I just use today. today okay um, and in terms of the ask where like so let's say 86% of the risk is Verizon firm specific but as a manager of this company how does this mean to me or it doesn't it only means something to investors uh, and my last question is about when I compare the performance to the market I just use let's say the because it's monthly return so I compare with the monthly TPO rate like, and you have to divide by 12. Monthly t uh, rate will still be annualized. Oh, yeah. yeah this I, yeah. I understand. But for Verizon, because I assume it's 100% US, so it's OK. But what it's got nothing to do with it being US. You, yeah. the, the, the rate you're going to compare to is based on the currency you've done your returns with. The so yeah. your returns are in dollars. You're going to use the t rate as a comparison. Yeah. So uh, let's say if it is like Disney, I actually need to confirm, I need to calculate the uh, return per for each country and then... No, you can't do a return for each country. How would you do that? There's like only by one the stock. Oh, yeah, right? I see. This is a return on a stock, right? There's no return by country or something. It's just one stock. Oh, right? You yeah. can do it only for the whole company. Okay, so, but this doesn't inconsistent with the, yeah, the equity risk premium, which way is, is used no, the it's basic, premium. No, if you're in a risky country and investors in your company are doing it in dollars, this is nothing to do with what country you're in. This has to do with what can I make risk-free in the currency in which I've computed the returns. Yeah. Right? Which is going to be the same, whether you're 50% in the U.S., 10% in the U.S., or 100% in the U.S. The choice of, if I didn't invest in Disney, I invested in something risk-free in dollars. Yeah. That number is not going to change whatever Disney's composition is. But we adjusted um, by the proportion of the revenue. When we did the equity risk premium yes. to come up with the cost of equity, right? So that, yeah. that, that's not even part of this equation. Where is it even coming in? So when we do the comparisons 
of individual projects, you can ask where is the project located. This has nothing to do with this. This is buying Disney stock and making a return on the stock overall. Yeah, but it's here, right? In this part, we need to consider the uh, different revenue streams from no, different countries. No, you don't countries. need a risk premium. You just need to, com to compute the expected return for Disney in the future. You use a cost of equity. There, you're not doing comparisons of risk premium. So basically, you're computing what the expected return has to be in dollar terms today. Okay. It's a currency choice. It's got nothing to yeah. do. You can't mess with your risk free rate because of the yeah. way you do business. Your risk free rate depends on the currency you've chosen to do the analysis. Okay. So it'll be in dollars no matter what if you decide to do it in dollars. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yep. I just have a question about mm -hmm. like betas and cost of equity.